So um, let's start the last day of the streaming workshop in Taiwan. Um, so Shiraz, who needs no introduction, is going to give us the <laughs> <laughs> second exciting lecture. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, let, let's, uh, let's continue from where we left off yesterday. Um, um, today I promised to explain to you that there is a con uh, the reason that we believe there is a duality between two theories. The first theory was uh, a theory of, um, of covariantly coupled critical scales. <coughs> level in. Okay, and the second theory was the theory of uh, uh, fermions, just, you know, uh, plus a mass deformation. And let's call that NB. This is NF. Um, and uh, the claim was that these two theories were dual to each other. They were the same theory, provided we had identified kappa f as minus kappa b, and uh, nf as equal to kappa b, kappa b minus nb. Okay. Uh, there's also a relationship between the masses, um, which is roughly m. CRI is equal to lambda F MF. I may have got the sign and a factor wrong. I look it up in my papers. Okay. Um, so this is the claim duality. Um, and uh, as, as, uh, as we uh, recounted last time, this duality is the, the mic is. <laughs> oh yeah, I just removed the mic totally. Not really sensitive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and um, okay, great. Um, uh, I wanted to remind you that this these relations told us that mod lambda f was equal to one minus mod lambda. Followed from the definitions of lambda. Remember that uh, lambda here is the Tauft parameter of the theory. So um, I'll remind you, lambda was equal to n divided by kappa. Okay. So this is a strong weak coupling duality, in the sense that if one of the theories has small lambda, the other theory has lambda near to one. Uh, now some of you may be wondering, uh, thinking it's a bit unusual. To you have a strong weak coupling duality relating 0 to 1. You're used to thinking of 0 being related to infinity. But of course, that's just a variable redefinition. In particular, if you have defined lambda tilde, which is equal to n divided by k, rather than n divided by kappa. And I remind you that k was equal to uh, kappa. Sorry, kappa. Kappa was equal to k plus n. Mod kappa was equal to mod k plus n then lambda equals 1 in our notation would turn into lambda tilde equals infinity. Okay? Uh, lambda equals 1 in our notation is the largest value that lambda can take. Just because kappa being k plus n is always larger than n. Okay? So lambda equals 1 if, in my perhaps bad notation is extreme strong coupling. Lambda equals 0 is extreme weak coupling. And these two theories are claimed to be dual to each other under uh, lambda goes to 1 minus lambda, which is strong weak coupling duality. Okay, it's the moral analog of g goes to 1. Okay. And in fact, if we worked with lambda tilde, actually it is lambda tilde goes to 1 over lambda tilde. Okay, excellent. Now, um, in the next one, I plan the next one and a half hours in the following way. In the 
first um, half an hour, I, uh, 20 minutes to half an hour, I'll give you a, um, uh, a brief summary of the various strands of evidence uh, for this duality. And then in the last hour, I will focus on um, a particular computation that also gives evidence for this duality, but throws up some structural surprises, the computation of the scattering matrix in these theories. OK. Uh, so first, let me turn to the uncontroversial stuff. OK. So these two theories are claimed to be the same. Question, Ross. Yes. So in this strongly theory, so at one point, the, the, the mass would be 0? Yes. Okay. So let's immediately focus on that point. Yeah. Um, the, the, there's a particular point, which is a duality between two massless theories. These two massless theories are actually both conformal theories. And I remind you that the statement of conformal invariance is, is not um, a classical statement. It's not even, in this case, a large n uh, or an infinite n state. Okay? The argument for conformal invariance for the fermions we gave in my first lecture, there was just no marginal relevant operator. Uh, the argument for conformal invariance for the bosons actually um, turns out to be basically very similar. It relies on the fact, once again, that there is no marginal relevant operator in the critical bosonic theory. Okay? This actually is accurate. Actually, both arguments are, are really reliable only in the neighborhood of, of large enough n, but not necessarily infinity. The point being is that near large enough n, phi bar phi, the operator phi bar phi, which has nigh classical dimension 1, actually turns out to have a, di a dimension 2. This is a famous result of the study of uh, of O-N coupled vector models in these theories, okay? And so phi bar phi squared is a, a dimension four, a near to four operator, uh, and so is as, um, uh, is irrelevant. And so these theories, at least in a finite neighborhood of N equals infinity, and uh, we, we'll get to more details, are both, both conformally invariant in the, in, the, in the particular case, M equals zero. Okay. Well, I was actually more referring to that the fact that if you have strongly coupled on the bosonic side, yes. there's this mass relation, right? And it can relate to this lambda f goes to zero limit. That wouldn't that mean that the boson mass is not zero? Even okay. The fermion mass is not. Okay. And now, you know, these are bare masses. Okay. 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 The real issue is what is the pole mass of the theory? Okay. And uh, um, I would have to give you more details, but the, this relationship. Is adjust is is has the feature that the pole masses of the two theories are the same. Okay, so as you take the pole masses to zero on one side, you take the pole mass to zero on the other side, it becomes conformal. Uh, we'll see this more explicitly in the S matrix because, of course, you can't have two S matrices the same unless the yeah. pole masses are the same. Okay, so so this the bare mass relation doesn't mean much. Okay, because we control the theory so well. You know, we can really see what bare mass relation gives means in terms of physical parameters. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so uh, very briefly now, let me re review the kind of evidence that we have uh, for this duality. The first, you know, the first, at the first very basic level, at the first very basic level, one can try to look at both these theories at their zero coupling point. So we can study the bosonic theory at coupling um, at lambda equals 0, and study the fermionic theory at lambda equals 0. Now, these are not necessarily, these are not related to each other, because it's strongly coupling, coupled bosonic theory that's related to the uh, weakly coupled fermionic theory and vice versa. But still, it'll help us set, set you know, get, get oriented just to consider both theories at very weak coupling. Okay? So uh, these theories are free in the case of the fermions, or almost free in the case of the bosons. Okay? And so very easy to study. Okay? Um, so one question you could ask is, what is the operator spectrum of the theory a in the free limit? Okay? Now, the important point here is that we use the simplification of large n. That is, we're not interested in all operators of the theory, but only in single trace operators. Or what would have been called single trace had we been dealing with a theory with, with adjoint matter. Of course, what we're dealing with is uh, the theory with fundamental matter. Now, the thing that 
plays the role of a, uh, of a trace in a theory with fundamental matter is just a fundamental contractor with the 90 fundamental. These are sometimes called single sum operators. And the famous trace factorization relations for traces in an adjoint theory uh, has counterparts for trace factorization theorems for single sum operators and theories with fundamentals. So if you know the spectrum of single sum operators, just by multi-particling the, spe the spectrum, you know the spectrum of all operators. Okay? So we can focus, it's sufficient to focus on single sum operators. But now single sum operators are very simple. Because it's just a product of one fundamental times one anti-fundamental. Because we can have whatever derivatives we want on the fundamental, whatever derivatives we want on the anti-fundamental, but that's really easy to count. So you know, um, I want to just do this very briefly so we don't spend much time, but, but let me give you, just, just to show you how easy it is. Okay, I uh, want, want to quickly do the counting for the scalar theory. Um, see, the only difference between the scalar theory at including the interactions and the scalar theory without the interactions, this critical and non-critical theory as far as the operator spectrum is concerned, um, is that there is one operator in the critical theory, namely the operator phi bar phi, which has dimension two in the critical theory, but had dimension one in the free theory. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to count the spectrum of operators in the free theory for the scalars, and then replace the one dimension two, one primary with a dimension two primary. That'll give me the spectrum of operators in the critical scalar theory. Is this clear? Good, how do I count the spectrum of operators in the free scalar theory? That's very easy. What I, what I, I, I'll write down some partition function. A partition function that is trace x to the power delta and y to the power j3, where j3 is the third component of angular momentum. Okay, over the full operator spectrum of the theory. Now, uh, you see, what I've got is some number of derivatives on phi and some number of derivatives on phi bar. Okay, so I just have to count all of these, the partition function for this, times the partition function for this. That gives me the full answer. <laughs> okay? Now, okay, the partition function for this phi is just x to the half because we're dealing with the scale free theory. There's no angular momentum dimension half. The partition function for all derivatives, well, the three derivatives. There's a deri each of the derivatives have dimension one, but the three derivatives have angular momentum one, zero, minus one. Okay? So you get one, 1 minus yx times 1 minus x times 1 minus x by y. This gives me the partition function for all operators I can, I can form by putting derivatives, arbitrary numbers of derivatives of phi. You know, a harmonic oscillator for the first kind of derivative, second, and third, because you can have as many derivatives as you want. Except that this ignores the fact that I shouldn't count op all operators, I should only count operators as distinct if they are unrelated by equations of motion. So I just subtract all operators that would be zero by the equations of motion, which is one minus uh, x squared, because del squared, which is the equation of del squared equals zero, has dimension of x squared. Okay? This is the full, so let me call this z letter of x and y. This is the full partition function of all operators of the form one derivative on phi, modulo equations of motion. The partition function for the full part, uh, for all operators of the form this times this is z letter of x comma y, the whole thing squared. Because each of those partition functions are the same and it's independent. So this gives me the full partition function, the full counting function for all operators, uh, all single sum operators that can form this theory. However, this includes both primaries as well as descendants of the conform natural. Okay? Now, what we have to do is to take this partition function and rewrite it as a sum over characters of the conformal algebra to know what representations appear. So which primaries appear. Okay? Um, this is not a hard job, uh, but it's not productive to do it on the board with you. It doesn't. It's, it's some simple algebra. And you find that this partition function tells you that the operator content of the theory is sum over is equal to 1 comma 0 uh, plus 
plus 2 comma 1 plus 3 comma 2 all the way to infinity where I'm labeling pro uh, primaries of the conformal group by their scaling dimension and the angular moment. So there's one primary with dimension 1 and spin 0. That's simply phi bar phi. There's one primary with dimension 2 and spin 1. That's simply the charge current. You know, the usual charge current, right? OK? There's one primary with dimension 3 and spin 2. That's the stress tensor. And so on. This, this list goes on for infinity. To infinity. This n plus 1n for all n. This was accounting in the free theory. This was accounting in the free theory. However, in the interacting theory, I told you the rule. This primary, which was 1, 0, is replaced by a primary that's 2, 0 at large. In the interacting theory, meaning inter turning on this critical interaction, but still staying at lambda equals 0. So if we want the answer for the free theory, I just replace it 1 by 2, and that's my answer. OK. On the other hand, if we, if we were to do the same counting in the fermionic theory, it's, it's as easy. Simple counting problem. You do it. And you know what you get? You get 2, 0 plus 2, 1 plus 3, 2 plus exactly the same. OK? That's a bit of a surprise. It's, 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 it's a little uh, curiosity. But these two theories, at their free points, have exactly the same at large end, have exactly the same spectrum. Now, that doesn't mean much because, you know, I, I claimed that there was a duality between the free theory and the very strongly coupled theory. However, um, it is not difficult to use re conformal representation theory plus large end factorization to demonstrate that this operator spectrum of single trace operators is not renormalized as a function of lambda. You see, we, we, we try, we're getting... Uh, the, it's a little like we're dealing with a supersymmetric theory, where large n factorization is playing the role of supersymmetry in giving us power. We're seeing a non-renormalization theorem that allows us to compare two theories even, uh, even though we only did free calculations. Okay? And then this non-renormalization theorem plus this agreement is the first bit of, admittedly so far, weak evidence for the equivalence between these two theories. But not totally trivial. And these numbers didn't have to be the same. Okay. Now, this, of course, would not have convinced anyone. Okay. Now, there was the there's a there are two other pieces of evidence apart from the, the scattering amplitude that I will tell you about in great detail. Um, there are two other pieces of, uh, of evidence that are, of course, are much more detailed and much more convincing. The second piece of evidence is that in very impressive computations by Maldasena and Zhubadev, and then by Maldasena, Aharoni, Gurari, Jacobi, uh, Gyombi, uh, the Israeli and Princeton groups, okay, using, uh, uh, using uh, um, a combination of powerful conceptual and powerful calculational methods, they were able to show that the three-point functions that the three-point functions of these primary operators okay, also agreed. But the agreement was much less trivial. The, two point, the, the spectrum of operators agreed in a slightly trivial way because it wasn't a function of lambda. The spectrum of primaries was just not renormalized, and so it agreed. The three-point functions, in this case, turn out to be functions of lambda. So they're functions of lambda on the bosonic sec, and functions of lambda on the fermionic sec. But quite remarkably, under this parameter map, the function of lambda you get for the bosonic three-point functions turns into the function of lambda for the fermionic three-point functions. Okay? These are quite complicated functions. I mean, by some standard, no hypergeometric functions here, but, uh, but, but you know, quite involved functions, not, not constants. Okay? Uh, and, um, and they matched. This is quite striking. Sounds unlikely to be a coincidence. Okay. Now there was there is one other piece. There's, there, there was another kind of piece of uh, piece of evidence for this duality, um, which is completely complementary. Is completely complementary, and uh, 
also works. So let me explain that, that, that other piece of evidence. The other piece of evidence goes as follows. Using large end techniques of the sort that I will review when we are discussing scattering, it was also possible to perform the following computation. For each of these theories, you could put the theory on S2 and put it at finite temperature. I remind you that this is real temperature. It's not an index. You know, because there's no supersymmetry, there isn't an index available to us. Okay? It's real finite temperature. Okay. And it turns out, with one or two assumptions along the way, uh, to be possible to do the computations of these partition functions on both sides. Okay? On the bosonic side and on the Fermi side. Now, these partition functions, as some of you know from experience with that n equal 4 yang theory, are quite interesting objects. They're quite interesting objects because while there is a range of temperatures in which the partition function is um, just a partition function of free gas of the single trace operators of your theory, there is also another range of temperatures when it is not. The transition between the temperatures in which it's a free gas and the uh, temperatures in which uh, free or mildly interacting gas and the, trans uh, te uh, the temperatures in which it's not, the transition between these, these two phases has a name. It's called the de deconfinement transition. And it's expected that the bulk dual description of the confined phase, that's the phase which is a free gas, is that of you know, just gravitons in global ABS, whereas the bulk dual description of the deconfined phase is much more interesting. It's a black hole. Okay, this was the case for um, um, for uh, n equals four Yangmills or a two-dimensional field theory with the Yang with a Yangmills coupled gauge field. Actually, in the case of these John Simons theories, um, in the case of these John Simons theories, uh, things are even more interesting. So there's a parameter. There's a parameter in the theory. Let's call it x, which is t divided by square root of n. Okay, the temperature and units of square root of n. Okay. And as a function of x, both these theories happen to undergo two phase transitions. So both these partition functions we were able to compute exactly. Okay, making some assumptions which are a little reasonable. We were able to compute exactly. Um, and both these theories undergo two phase, two kinds of phase transitions. At a, at a certain temperature, you undergo the deconfinement transition. At a higher temperature, you undergo another phase transition to a, a very John Simons-y phase, which we don't really have a good bulk interpre interpretation of yet. It uh, has to do with sort of a maxima in the eigenvalue density of holonomy, eigenvalues of holonomy matrix, which I don't have the time to explain to you here unless somebody's interested. All I wanted to say was that there is a very intricate phase diagram Okay, with two phase transitions on both sides. Okay? And only in the lowest temperature phase of these can you think of both phases as being even approximately a gas of the, of the single trace operators. The result is that the free energies on both sides match perfectly. In every phase. You know, the phase transitions match, the full, the full answers match perfectly. Okay? Now, this is, in my opinion, very impressive and complementary, you know, complementary uh, evidence compared to the um, matching of correlation functions. Because correlation functions are these trace by trace things. On the other hand, black holes of these, the deconfined phase cannot be thought of in terms of traces. So it's in a completely different phase of the theory, it's completely different kinds of physics. Both things match, both correlators as well as the free energy computations. Give you the same answer to both sides for the Fermi answer to both. Strictly at large n, but they both match. Okay? Combining these two strands of information, okay, it seems unreasonable to believe that these theories are not dual, at least at large n. Okay? So there's um, um, Okay, 
I think I think I'll just stop. There's one more thing about the deformation of the of supersymmetric dualities that also gives an argument, but I, I won't review that for now. Okay, so the, this I would say is the is the set of evidence that we have for these these two two different dualities, uh, forming the backdrop of the the, uh, the the problem I will now try to uh, try to solve for you and try to analyze for you, namely that of scattering. Uh, one one last thing I should say is that while the while the uh, uh, matching of correlators was only done at the conformal points that you did ask me about. Um, the matching of free energies was done with an arbitrary mass deformation and still agrees. Okay? Okay. Um, so, the, the, it's the matching of, uh, of uh, um, it's the matching of, uh, um, uh, of the partition functions that's, that was the first source of information for the, for the map between the mass parameters. Okay. Any questions or comments before we proceed? <coughs> Excellent. So this forms the backdrop for, for the rest of the talk, which is the study of the study of S matrices in these theories. Now let me quickly motivate that before uh, before starting the calculations. You see, in these theories, well, one of the things that's really interesting about these theories is that we've got a duality between fermions, or what looks like fermions at one side, naively looks like fermions. Um, uh, and on the other side, what, what looks like bosons. This, so in some sense, what's going on here is some sort of bosonization. Right? The theory of fermions is the same as the theory of Fermi, uh, bosons. But neither of the calculi... And, okay. Now, there is, of course, one uh, um, paradigmatic example of bosonization, <coughs> which is bosonization in two dimensions. And bosonization in two dimensions is summarized by a really beautiful formula. Okay. It's the formula that tells you what the fermionic operator is in terms of the bosonic operator. Psi is equal to e to the pi. And this formula completely summarizes bosonization. It tells you how to make the fermion out of the bosons. OK? No. What? In order to completely understand, to feel sort of completely satisfied that we understand this duality, we would, you, you might think we would want something like this. OK? Except that that's too much to ask when you think about it. Why? You see, what does this formula mean? What this formula means is that all correlation functions of psi are equal to correlation, the same correlation functions of e to the pi. And the two-dimensional context is a completely well-defined statement. However, in our context, our bosons and fermions are both gauge non invariant so correlation functions of phi's are not well defined in general. Correlation functions of size are not well defined in general. So such a formula doesn't even make sense, apart perhaps in some particular gauge, but, but then that's not very interesting. Okay? So such a formula, right, doesn't doesn't look like we could could get something like this. So in two dimensions, doesn't also doesn't work in naive form on a higher genus remember. Here, do you expect the duality to work on the uh, beyond the local operator? Uh, if you put it on the uh, non-trivial dimension surface, uh, torus or something, is it is the spectrum of these? Mm. I don't know. Um, as you know, you know the connection to Vasiliev theory uh, gets a bit involved in these of these higher genus surfaces. And since Vasiliev theory is one explanation for this duality, that perhaps suggests that there's some com some issue, some complications. I'm, I'm not sure. It's an interesting question. Yeah, the evidence so far is just on S two. Well, S two and R three. Okay, good. Um, fine. So, but you know. Still, having said that this, that because of this gauge invariance, we can't hope for such a strong formula, it's still a bit unsatisfying to only know connections between bilinears. Because the map between operators was between bilinears. And that obscures the fact that one of